Have you ever heard someone say, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. When it comes to evolution, that seems to be the attitude for many, including some of the greatest minds in the world. Since Darwin, every knowing person agrees, man descended from the apes. Today, there's no such thing as the theory of evolution. It is the fact of evolution. I heard Carl Sagan say that on TV. I heard Isaac Asimov say that. This is Ernst Mayer from Harvard saying that. Evolution is not a theory, it's a fact. By the way, you know what this is called? A statement like this? It's called baloney. Albert Einstein once said, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. Is that what keeps happening with the theory of evolution? So atheistic evolutionists then assert there's no creator, designer, God, therefore purposeless, non-directed, accidental, mindless, random, chance processes produce the universe and everything animate and inanimate in it. You are the result of, if you don't believe in God, mindless processes. The question that immediately comes to mind is, haven't scientists documented the progression of evolution over millions of years? Evolutionists can't give one example in nature of a random chance mutation, that's a change in a gene, that increases or produces new genetic information in the genome. Not one. Zero. Well, then where's the evolution? So what's the truth about creation and evolution? Is one fact and the other a fraud? Is creation truly divine and evolution simply a deception? If you've been struggling with these same questions, then you'll want to watch this video by Dr. Joe Martin. Fact or fraud? Is evolution evolving? This is the second session of Dr. Martin's four-part video series titled, The Evolution of a Creationist. In session one, Dr. Martin answers the question, does it really matter if man evolved or was created? In session three, Dr. Martin brings solid answers to the scientific debate about cause or coincidence. In the final session, Dr. Martin provides clear evidence about the age of our planet in How Young Is Earth? For years, Dr. Martin wrestled with the same questions. As a scientist, he was sure he knew the answers. But then his faith as a Christian completely changed his life. Dr. Martin is a true scientist to the core, majoring in biology at Bucknell University and earning his doctorate of medical dentistry from the University of Pittsburgh Dental School. Recognized for his exceptional abilities, Dr. Martin was assigned to the 89th Military Airlift Wing. He was a dentist for President Johnson's Presidential Air Fleet. With years of scientific theory and practice, Dr. Martin became a professor at Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas, Texas. It was here that this scientist had to face the realities of evolutionary belief. In 1986, Dr. Martin graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary and founded Biblical Discipleship Ministries. As an author and speaker, Dr. Martin is in great demand, lecturing and debating on college campuses and churches across the U.S. and around the world. Let's join Dr. Martin as he explores the question, fact or fraud, is evolution evolving? Our theme verse, as we talk about these things, is Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man. And I'm saying the way of evolution is a way that seems right to so many people. But it ends in death. And that was me uh, for the first part of my life uh, many, many years. And I didn't even think about that, but that was me. So that's Proverbs 14, 12. Mike Riddle answers in Genesis, says a big part of the evolution worldview, their presupposition, is materialism. The importance of information to the creation evolution debate is founded in the presuppositions of each model. The presupposition of the evolutionary model is materialism, which is the idea that everything in the universe is solely comprised of matter, mass, and energy. From this foundational assumption, evolutionists conclude that cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, and biological evolution are all true. This reasoning and logic is sound if the presupposition is true. Because of this, many evolutionists refer to evolution as a fact. But what if the assumption of materialism is false? What if the universe consists of more than mass and energy? If the universe consists of more than the two fundamental entities of mass and energy, then the presupposition of materialism is false. 
The presupposition of the biblical model, creation, is that there is a God who created the universe, the earth, and all the organisms living on earth. Additionally, this model establishes that there is a non-material third fundamental entity called information. That requires intelligence for its initial creation. This means the universe consists of more than just mass and energy, and that the information found within the DNA RNA system of all life originated from the Creator God. Now, if there is such a thing as information, that means the whole evolutionary thing is false, because they assume just mass and energy got everything here. We're losing our kids. Now, how do we lose them? I have some examples. One example from a secular, several from a secular university, a, a Christian university, and some frauds in the textbooks. So the first example is the front page of a paper that a student did at a major university here in the United States. He was right at the top of his class, majoring in microbiology. This is the end of his first semester, senior year, when he hands it in. He has one more semester and he graduates. He writes a paper comparing and contrasting the regulation of the lactose and galactose operons and regulons in Streptococcus thermophilus, Streptococcus mutans, and Lactococcus lactis. On the front page, he said a bad word. This genetic group control mechanism is a wonderfully designed informational system for efficiently using substrates only when available or desirable. He used the word design in a science class. You can't do that. There's no such thing as design. It's all just random chance processes. And his professor went berserk. And his professor wrote all over the page, I suggest you grow up or think very hard about your major. It's ludicrous for you to major in biology. Creationism is not science. It is not testable. It cannot predict future behavior. This paper is poorly focused, immature, and pedantic. Much irrelevant information, blatantly apologetic, inappropriate for a science course. Poor science. Science is not anti-religion, but your religion is clearly anti-science. Pick another field where your personal opinions are all that matters. I suppose my reaction will feed your martyr complex, but so be it. I too am a devout Christian. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. I believe I'm saved through the redeeming power of Christ Jesus. However, my faith is not simplistic, literalistic, inconsistent, and uninformed and prejudiced as yours appears to be. Again, think hard about your major and your course selections for the fall. Well, is that a Christian professor? with trying to disciple his Christian brother? No, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a professor with an agenda. They want our children. They want, us, they want to steal the Christian worldview out from under our children. What's the average college student do? They pull out their white flag, okay? They pull out their white flag and they say, okay, professor, tell me what to believe. I was wrong, professor, tell me what to believe. And we're losing up to 88% according to the statistics. So, is there design out there? Well, here's what Stephen Gould from Harvard says, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions in organic design. Whoop! There's an evolutionist that uses the word design. You know what this is saying? The absence of fossil evidence, that means there's nothing in the fossils, for the intermediary stages between major transitions, for something between a reptile and a bird. He says, we can't even imagine what that would be. Uh, how would you even construct a functional intermediate between a reptile and a bird? He, we don't even know. He says, this is a problem for the gradualistic accounts of evolution. So that's why he became a punctuated equilibrianist. Uh, he decided Darwinian evolution, there's no evidence. It happens too slow to see. We don't find it anywhere. We'll go to too fast to see. And that's punctuated equilibrium. Now, here's what Darwin said. He didn't know how one species could change into another. This is four years after he wrote his book. He says, when we descend to details, we can prove no one species has changed. This is Darwin himself. That is, we cannot prove that a single species has changed, nor can we prove that change, the supposed changes are beneficial, which is the groundwork of the theory. Well, what's a beneficial change? Let's say a monkey-like creature is going to evolve into people. Now, you go to the zoo, you look at the primates. Their feet have a big toe that looks like a thumb. All right, they're going to evolve out of being a primate into being a human. Now, primates, they have a big toe like a thumb. Humans, we, our big toe sticks out the front. So, you're going to evolve from back here, out the back and out the side, to all the way up and out the front. 
what would a beneficial change be? Let's say you get up to a 45 degree angle toe. Is that a beneficial change? Well, no, now you can't climb trees as good as, as if you have a thing like a thumb on your foot. Uh, you can't run as good as if they are coming out the front. Survival of the fittest, you're out of there, you see? So that's what Darwin is saying. I don't, what, what would a beneficial change be? Well, well, that was way back there. Let's come up, Ernst Mayer from Harvard, 1983, Omni Magazine. He said this, we had an international conference in Rome in 1981 on the mechanisms of speciation. How does one species change into another? He says, it was attended by many of the leading botanists, zoologists, paleontologists, geneticists, cytologists, biologists. The one thing on which they all agreed was, we still have absolutely no idea what happens genetically during speciation. That's an expletive statement, but it's the truth. Well, now, what's he saying? They write the textbooks that teach our children that evolution is true and that one species evolves into another, and they haven't even figured out how that could happen. You see, we're talking a religious, faith-based view called evolution because they don't want to believe in God. This is Jastrow from our space program. He's an evolutionary scientist. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak, the evolutionary scientist. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Now, what's he saying? He's not saying, hey, I have become a creationist. What he's saying is, hey, guys, my fellow evolutionists, we're going to have to do better. We've got to come up with some better evidence here to support our view. It looks like those creationists have the best arguments. We have the most science that backs up our view. They're aware of that. All right, so you go to a Christian college. This is a page out of a textbook at a Christian college. Now, look what it says on distinguishing science from non-science what science is, and it has a good definition, understanding how nature works based on objective evidence that includes reproducible experimental data and measurements and observations, that's good. What science isn't? So what is not science at this Christian college? Science is not art, astrology, creationism, whoop. A Christian college that says creationism is not science? Yes, creationism is like extrasensory perception, fortune-telling, healing crystals, philosophy, psychic phenomenon, reincarnation, religion, telekinesis, telepathy, therapeutic touch. Well, we send our Christian young people to a Christian college, and they get a textbook that tells them creationism is the same as healing crystals and extrasensory perception? Yep, that's a Christian college. Well, what's happening? Well, you see, there's a whole bunch of fraudulent things out there. Now, one of the most fraudulent, I believe, are the Heckel's embryos. Uh, he tried to present that idea of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In other words, when you're in your mother's womb, you go through all the different stages of evolution. You go through a fish stage. You go through a reptile stage. That's fraudulent. Well, why? Well, because these embryos, they don't look like that. He fudged his drawings to make us think we look like that in the pictures in the textbooks. And they're still in the textbooks. Now, um, uh, Dr. Michael Richardson published some photographs of the real embryos. And that stimulated, back in 1997, Science Magazine and others to actually admit, you know what, there's some fraud out there in the textbooks. So Science Magazine, back in September of 1997, generations of biology students may have been misled by a famous set of drawings of embryos published 123 years ago by German biologist Ernst Haeckel. Not only did Haeckel Adder omit features, he also fudged the scale to exaggerate similarities among species, even when there was a tenfold difference in size. That's called fraud. How about the new scientists, same month, September of 1997? They came out with these articles then because Dr. Richardson published his pictures. And all of a sudden, we now have true pictures that show Haeckel's embryos weren't true. New scientist. Although Heckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena. That was like in about 1874. In other words, fraudulent pictures have been known to be fraudulent pictures since 1874, and they're still in the current textbooks. At the University of Jena, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, says Dr. Richardson. It is. Why are those drawings still in the book? Because the evolutionists don't have any evidence, you see. How about those human embryo pictures you see that have labels like gill slits, yolk sac, or tail? Are those labeled correctly? And the textbooks still have them labeled like that. No, those gill slits aren't gill slits. They're, they aren't even slits. They're pouches on the human embryo, and they don't have anything to do with breathing underwater ever. 
uh, they form your, like your parathyroid glands, your thymus gland, uh, your middle ear canal. Nothing to do with breathing at all. They're labeled gill slits. Why? Because the evolutionary community wants our children to think you go through a fish stage when you're in your mother's womb, and fish have gills. So they just mislabel something to make you think you had gills, you see? That yolk sac, that doesn't mean you were a reptile, came out of a, an egg. That's not a yolk sac. That's your blood-forming organ. Before you have your bones to make your blood, you don't take your mother's blood. Your, your mother's umbilical cord does not pump her blood right into your arteries. You make your own blood from the very beginning. And that's the organ that makes your blood. Before, you may not have the same type of blood as your mother, okay? Like, my wife is O, my daughters are A. There's not even the same type of blood. So, this mislabeled yolk sac to give you this impression, oh yeah, I used to be a reptile. And I'm just kind of duplicating that in my mother's womb. And then your tail. They have these things labeled a tail. It's not a tail. It's your coccyx. There's muscles that are hooked up down there. You fall on your tailbone. You realize there's things that are hooked up down there because it gets very, very sore. And so those, those aren't true. But they want us to think of macroevolution. You see, this Big Bang idea uh, that all of a sudden now, over millions of years, here comes in the seawater or something, you get a cell, and then your cell's a fish, and then the fish becomes an amphibian, the amphibian a reptile, the reptile birds and mammals and all that. Does that ever happen anywhere? No, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. We can't see it in the fossils, and we can't see it in life. It doesn't happen. Well, is there any kind of evolution we can see? Well, they call that microevolution. Now, that's not really evolution. Uh, usually, it is genetic loss. Usually, genes drop out, or genes uh, don't function some way. And then you get a new uh, type of horse or a new type of cow. They're still horses. They're still cows. There's no evolution there. Or you have a bacteria resistant to, let's say, penicillin. Oh, there it is. There's microevolution in action. Well, wait a minute. They now know that some of those bacteria had the penicillinase, the factory that makes the penicillinase, that breaks down the penicillin. They're the ones that survived. There's no evolution there. So, Microevolution doesn't prove macroevolution could occur, reptiles becoming birds. Microevolution is not even really evolution at all, as far as I can tell. Well, yeah, but what about Darwin's finches? Doesn't that prove evolution is true? Well, there were finches in Darwin's day. There are still finches today. Where's the evolution? Uh, yeah, some of them have different kinds of beaks, different sizes of beaks, but now they know that some of those, they'll change back and forth in the same bunch of birds, whether it's a a season that's easy to get food or a season that they have to peck around a lot, their beaks get longer, gets shorter. There's no evolution there. But don't those uh, peppered moths prove evolution is true? Well, in the, in, we're told in the Industrial Revolution, here, here comes the birds are eating all the, the one-colored moths because the tree trunks are covered with dust from the uh, Industrial Revolution. That's natural selection. Well, there's some problems there. Number one, the pictures in the textbook, most of those pictures those moths don't even live on tree trunks. They glued the moths to the tree trunks. Okay, that didn't become public knowledge till about 1999. They glued the moths to the tree trunks to take the pictures. Fact is, there were light and dark colored moths before. There were light and dark colored moths during the Industrial Revolution. There's light and dark colored moths today. What, where is the evolution? Is there any new genetic material in the birds, in the finches, in the moths? No, there's no ge new genetic material whatsoever. Their basic DNA remains the same. There's no evolution there anywhere at all. Well, doesn't evolution require, you then demand the input of new genetic information? Yes, it does. Otherwise, no true evolution has occurred. So, so far, we don't know of anything that has new genetic information anywhere. And the birds sure don't have it. Well, yeah, but don't those chemicals change? Can't those chemicals produce uh, evolution? Well, chemicals obey laws, but they can't generate new information. Evolutionists can't give one example in nature. I'm talking in nature. I'm not talking in a lab, in a controlled situation. They can't give one example in nature of a random chance mutation, that's a change in a gene, that increases or produces new genetic information in the genome. Not one. Zero. Now, there's recombinations of genes. There's genes that drop out. But new information? No. Characteristically, information is lost. Dr. Lee Spetner, in his book, Not By Chance, says this. Not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Not even one. He's an expert on information. 
Well, then where's the evolution? You see, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but its end thereof are the ways of death. There's no evidence for it, but as Lewontin said, as Watson said, we will not believe in God. We will believe in materialism no matter what the evidence shows us. So the issue, you see, is God. It has nothing to do with science. Now, they've made us out to be the religious people. Well, we can't teach creation in the schools. That's religion. We're going to teach science. We're going to teach evolution. Their evolution is just as religious as our creation. Now, I think natural selection and survival of the fittest fit the creation model. Let's, let's say this. Let's say we have three mooses. Mooses? We have three moose. Meese. We have three mooses, meeses. And we've got these three mooses, moose. We have one female, two males. Okay. Now, we have one male. He's evolving out of moosehood. We have one male, big, strong moose male. They're going to fight over the female. Which moose will get the female? The biggest, strongest, most mooseish moose will get the female, right? That is survival of the fittest. The fittest survive. God built that in to his different kinds in the creation so that the strongest of the kind survive and it protects the kind. So it's just the opposite of what evolution tries to present. I think that's very interesting. Now, if you had a picture, and let's say you have a coelacanth fish and you have a fern, and you just looked at the picture, would you say the coelacanth and the fern are related? No, you would say, no, they're not related. Let's say you have uh, a field, and over here's a tree, and then over here stands a horse. And you look at the tree, and you look at the horse. Would you say they are ancestors of each other somehow? They have ancestors, common ancestors. No, no, you would not say that. If you have a man standing next to a chimpanzee, and here you have the man, and here you have the chimpanzee down there on its knuckles, would you say the man and the chimpanzee are related? No, you wouldn't say that at all. Well, then why do we think they're related? Well, one of the reasons is because a very bright evolutionist a few decades ago got a good idea. We'll draw some lines in. And once we draw the lines in, we have our tree of life. Everything is related back to that one cell. And now you can just see it plain as day. Of course, the horse is related to the tree. You can see it. The, they're all coming from the same place, you see? Except in the textbooks, the lines don't have anything on them. It's just lines. Well, why is that? Well, that's where the missing links are. Now, they've changed the names of missing links. They don't call them missing links anymore. They call them transitional forms. That's the code word for missing links. Now, why did they do that? Well, if you say the transitional forms, they don't sound nearly as missing as if you say the missing link. Okay, so that's what they do now. Now, look what Stephen Gould says from Harvard. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record. Now, extreme rarity means zilch. Transitional forms, that's the code word for missing link. All he's saying here is, in the fossil, the missing links are still missing. That's all he's saying. But he says that persists as the trade secret of the fossil experts, the paleontologists. They have a little secret. There's nothing there in the fossils to prove evolution is true. He says, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks. Well, those are the ones that have the one cell, and then over here's the horse, and here's the tree, and they're all hooked up. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of the branches. The rest is inference. That means a big guess. However reasonable, not the evidence of fossils, says Stephen Jay Gould back in Natural History magazine a while back. So we're supposed to believe, then, that this simple cell just popped up and then gave birth to everything else. Well, a cell is not that simple. By the way, they don't like to talk about the cell membrane. Do you know the cell membrane? Like, it's like it has its own brain. The, a cell membrane, you can have a solution one two thousandth percent show up at the cell membrane. Say, I'm, I want in. And the cell membrane, nope, you can't come in. I can only let a one one thousandth solution in, not two one thousandth solution in. I mean, it can tell the difference at incredible uh, small concentrations. It can tell the difference. How does it do that? Well, God made it that way to protect life. And so the cell has all these amazing things in it. So Dr. Leon Long down there at the University of Texas in his textbook, Geology, his chapter on the origin and evolution of life, he says this, among the first organisms 
were the lowly bacteria and blue-green algae. By the way, true or false? Does God say, I want you to know I made blue-green algae first? No. He has picked some of the most simple things to make his point. And he says this, among the first organisms were the lowly bacteria and blue-green algae. They are about as simple as a self-sufficient cell can be, which is none too simple. Considering a bacterium can synthesize some 3,000 to 6,000 compounds of a rate of about a million reactions per second. We can't even build a city that can do that. You're sitting there right now with a little cell. You can't even see it without a microscope. It has 3,000 to 6,000 chemical factories inside of itself making chemical compounds of a rate of a million reactions per second, and you don't explode? Unbelievable. But our God did that, you see. The Creator did that. And He did it so we could marvel and give Him glory and give Him praise. Well, what does evolution claim then? The all organisms are related through a common ancestry. That's that tree of life. They're all related. That means you are related to ferns. You are related to bacteria. All organisms arose through the process of mutation and natural selection. Wait a minute. In order for that to happen, you'd have to add new information to that original blue-green algae to get people. There's no evidence they can add any information to the genome. I just read you a quote. All organisms arose and persist because of random chance processes of nature and millions of years. Give us the time and it'll happen, says the evolution. Evolution demands millions of years. Now, just to clarify something, you hear the word naturalism. Naturalism is the same as materialism. Materialism is the same as evolutionism. Evolutionism is the same as millions of years. They're all interchangeable. Now, in some of the textbooks battles here in Texas, the textbook company, one of them said, well, we don't teach evolution in our textbook. But they had millions of years all through the textbook. They're synonymous. They're synonymous. When you talk about naturalism, you're talking about materialism, you're talking about evolutionism, you're talking about millions of years. They're all the same. So then how is it all supposed to work? Well, random mutations cause changes or variations in a population of organisms. I don't think a, a, a creationist would argue with that. These different organisms then compete to survive and reproduce. That's true. Those which are best able to survive and reproduce do so. That's true. They tend to leave the most offspring. This is called natural selection. I don't have a problem with that. Over time, if some organisms survive and reproduce more than others, a species will evolve. I wouldn't use the word evolve exactly like that, but the fact is, it's still going to be a bird. It might be a different kind of finch, but it's still a finch. So yes, there's changes that happen that way. Well, how do we get then a, a monkey to become a man? Uh, how does that work? Is there any evidence for that? You see lots of pictures of a monkey or an ape or some kind of a primate, and then here comes one that his chin doesn't stick out quite as much, his nose begins to stick out a little bit more, and then a little while later he's looking a little less like a monkey, a little more like a man, and then finally you have Uncle Harry gets up and walks off. And so what do we have? We have the, the monkey or the ape, we have Uncle Harry, what are these in between forms that you see, the National Geographic kind of a thing, where you see all these different kinds of monkey-like or man-like monkeys and monkey-like men coming along here. What is that? We've got the monkey. We've got Uncle Harry. What is in between is called art. How do we know this? Well, because Science Digest told us concerning anthropological art, the study of man using art. It says, unfortunately, the vast majority of artists' conceptions are based more on imagination than evidence. We've got the monkey, we got the man, we got a lot of imagination in between. Much of the reconstruction, however, is guesswork. Bones say nothing about the fleshy parts of the nose, lips, or ears. Have you ever found a bone with a lip on it? How do they know what the lip looked like? Well, what does it say right here? Artists must create something between an ape and a human being. So that's, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to create something. The older a specimen is said to be, the more ape-like they make it. How do they know how old it was? The dating techniques don't work. I, I have a whole chapter in my book, The Evolution of a Creationist, on the fact that, the, that what are the assumptions behind the dating techniques? The dating techniques don't work as they use them. It says, hairiness is a matter of pure conjecture. Well, does anybody find bones with hair on them? How do they know that arm had hair or that leg had hair? 
There's no hair there. The guesswork approach often leads to errors, unquote. Well, that's, that's the way it is. That's how they come up with those ones in between the monkey and Uncle Harry. Now, look what Ernst Mayer from Harvard said back in 1983, Omni Magazine. Since Darwin, every knowing person agrees. Man descended from the apes. Today, there's no such thing as the theory of evolution. It is the fact of evolution. I heard Carl Sagan say that on TV. I heard Isaac Asimov say that. This is Ernst Mayer from Harvard saying that. Evolution is not a theory. It's a fact. By the way, you know what this is called? A statement like this? It's called baloney. That's what it is. It's just baloney. That's all it is. And so, even, this is another evolutionist, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic, says Dr. Scott Todd. That was in Nature magazine, letters to the editor back there in September of 2000. It's not naturalistic, so we can't include anything. It has anything to do with God. That means we can be here without God. So atheistic evolutionists then assert there's no creator, designer, God, therefore purposeless, non-directed, accidental, mindless, chance, random processes produce the universe and everything animate and inanimate in it. You are the result of, if you don't believe in God, mindless processes. Here you are. The Big Bang created space and time. That's what the evolutionists say. How can an explosion create space? Doesn't the space have to be there for the explosion to go somewhere? You see, a lot of faith goes into what we believe if we're going to believe in evolution. Now then, there's the thing called the law of biogenesis. And all that means is only living things give birth to living things. Okay, life is generated by life. Life begins with life. All things that are alive come from something that was alive. The Living World textbook says cells arise only by a division of a previously existing cell. Okay, sounds good to me. Well, where does life come from? Well, what does the Bible say? The Creator Himself. He says, He is the life. Jesus is the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the source of life. So I say, we don't know where this life comes from. They haven't been able to make it happen. Lifeless chemicals cannot generate life. Just, they just can't do it. Well, can dead chemicals organize themselves into a living, reproducing cell? They used to think you could get life started from amino acids just in our environment. Then they realized the amino acids will not bond into proteins in the presence of oxygen. So that's when Stanley Miller came along and the Miller-Urey experiments that some of you have heard about. And he says, well, we'll do a reducing atmosphere, no oxygen. And so he put some things. It was ammonia and methane, water vapor, and uh, hydrogen. And he puts them in there and he sparks it. By the way, no oxygen? Does water vapor have oxygen? There's a little bit of cheating on the experiment there, I think. But anyway, no oxygen. What did he get? He got some amino acids. Sure enough, they're called the building blocks of life. Except his amino acids were in equal amounts. The amino acids come out left and right-handed. They're like mirror images of each other. He got an equal amount of both, which is poison to life. Because if you're alive, you are 100% left-handed amino acids. All of life is left-handed, not a right-handed one in there. You throw a right-handed one in there, rigor mortis sets in, okay? You get sick and die. So you're going to be 100% left-handed. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means, yeah, he got his, his uh, amino acids, but he said there's no oxygen. Now, if there's no oxygen, that means no ozone layer. If there's no ozone layer, that means if he did get life, it would be crispy toast in just an instant. Also, there never was a reducing atmosphere on planet Earth, meaning no oxygen. The oldest rocks have lots of oxygen, oxidation in it. They have CO2, uh, lots of oxygen history in the oldest rocks. So the whole thing here was just an idea. Now, by the way, they're still working on that idea. And Dr. Stanley Miller is still alive, as I understand it, still working on these kinds of things. But now they know, this is my lifetime, now they know you can't get life started without oxygen. So that's when they put it under the water. Oh, life started under the water, in that primeval ocean. So it can't start in the presence of oxygen. It can't start without oxygen. So let's put it under the water. That'll take care of it. Can life start underwater? Well, no, it can't. Why? Because of a thing called hydrolysis. That's your 10th grade science book. What is hydrolysis? Well, that's the action of water on things like proteins. 
and it acts like a corrosive. It acts like a rust. It breaks them down. And so a college textbook, Life, 4th edition, McGraw-Hill, page 341, says this. In an aqueous, watery environment, hydrolysis is more likely to occur than its opposite reaction, dehydration synthesis. Dehydration means you get the water out. Well, how can you get the water out when you're in water? You see, so that, that makes sense. Hydrolysis breaks down chains of amino acids and nucleotides faster than they can form, countering the buildup of long chains. Well, that means you can't start life underwater. So what have we learned here then? That you can't originate life in oxygen. Life cannot originate without oxygen. Life cannot originate in water. How did life originate? We're only left with one option. In the beginning, God. Genesis 1, verse 1. That's the only option we're left with. And that's why this issue is so critical and crucial. And there's such a battle going on in our culture today. Because it all comes back to God. And there are people that just don't want the idea of God. Why? Well, Romans 1 tells us because they are ungodly and unrighteous. Now, some of them are very nice people. Now, we're talking about their soul and their spirit, but they're very nice people. But they have believed a lie. They have believed a lie, and they will defend that. And they, they, they suppress evidence. They study what God has made, like Romans 1 says. And then they refuse to tell us about the things that God has made, because they're ungodly. So, men, they study what God has made, they know about things that God has made, and then they hide the evidence. They suppress the truth. Things like, for instance, a cuttlefish. Now, this is supposed to be a, crim a primitive creature. This little creature is unbelievable. He has an eye like Batman, as you can see. He has binocular vision, as well as he can look out the sides, and he can look at one thing. Uh, he has three different types of color producing cells in his skin and they can even turn on the lights and they'll come up to their prey and they turn on the lights and it looks like the old marquee around the old theaters where the lights were going around there so it swims up to its prey and turn on the light turns on these lights and the prey is there like whoa what is that and all of a sudden it has these two things on each side of its head that are kind of like those party favors you blow you go and it goes out and then rolls back and it will take that little thing on each side of its head and shoots it out and grabs its prey and sucks its prey back and it has these tentacles in front like an octopus or a squid and then it eats its prey. Uh, you can make these things angry. Scientists have ticked these things off and when they get angry they will turn bright red. In an instant, all of their skin just boom, bright red. I am ticked. Okay, a little thing. Some of them only big as your hand. Uh, some of them about three feet long down in Australia. They can mimic texture. They'll go down on the bottom of the ocean and it's sand with pebbles. And they'll turn the color of the sand on their skin. And then they'll raise up bumps in their skin to make it look like pebbles. Or if they're floating in uh, like kelp, seaweed, they'll put their tentacles up and make it look like seaweed and turn them green. This is a primitive animal. Absolutely not. They are unbelievable. Uh, the camel. Oh, camels, we all know about camels. What's in the camel's hump? Would you say it's water? Uh, would you say it's fat? Well, it's fat. But as the camel goes out and can't eat and can't drink, it eats its hump. And when it eats the fat in the hump, it converts it to the proteins, as well as each gram of fat gives off a gram and a half of water. So it eats and drinks its hump. Now, as it eats and drinks the hump, the hump begins to slump. So if you see a camel with a slumped hump, you know he's hungry, he's thirsty. So they come in, they're going to drink. They can drink up to 28 gallons of water in about 10 minutes. Just, I mean, if you did that, you'd be dead. They can regulate their temperature. Let's say it's a really hot day on the desert. The camels get together. They huddle together. Why? Because they can turn the temperature down to 93 degrees. And so it's cooler for them to clump together on a particularly cold night on the desert. And sometimes it gets very cold on the desert. They turn up the temperature. They can turn it up to 105. They are made for conditions on the desert. By the way, they don't have any fat under their skin. God put all their fat in the hump. Now, most mammals have fat under their skin. Now, don't sit there thinking, I'm a mammal. I have fat under my skin because you're not a mammal, according to God. 
If you think you're a mammal, that puts you in the animal kingdom, you see. We're not in the animal kingdom. We're created above the animal kingdom to take dominion over the animal kingdom. We are humans, humankind, made in the image of God. Anyway, so it doesn't have any fat under its skin. That's so it doesn't bake itself in the desert. If it had fat, it would insulate it. It would, it would bake its own self. It has a, these huge calluses, camels, big huge calluses on their elbows, on their chest. They have a big one on their chest. What's that for? When they lie down in the hot sand, the callus is what's on the sand, and that holds their internal organs up off the sand so they don't bake their own internal spleen, okay? Got their feet, when they put it down, it's like a snowshoe. They, can, they have certain eyelids on a, on, a, on a sandstorm. They can still see. They can close their nose so the dust doesn't come in, but they can still breathe. They can close their ears so that the sand doesn't go in their ears. What are we talking about here? We are talking about a miraculous creature that God made for the desert. And it needs all its parts. It's irreducibly complex. You can't have a camel with all, all the... By the way, what evolved into camels? What are camels evolving into? You see, God made each thing after its own kind. So a camel is a wonderful thing. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, what is his name? What's the name of the creator? His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. By the way, it, there's a group of people that say, well, and the Word was a God, because there's no article there. This is called an anarthrous predicate nominative. There's no article for emphasis. There's a special rule in the Greek that says that. God is saying, Jesus is God. He was with God. He is God. He's not a God of many. All things were made by Him, Jesus, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Scientists say, we don't know how life got started. Well, it's because they won't believe in Him, you see? And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We live in darkness, and we're to be the light. So the Lord Jesus is the Creator. It tells us that in Colossians 1 also. Then it tells us the same thing in Hebrews 1, that it, He is the one that made it all, and He is the one that purges us from our sins. John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Jesus is the Creator. Did the Creator use normal days in Genesis? The word there is yom, Genesis 1, yom, like yom kippur. It's a Hebrew word for day. Uh, some people say that day in Genesis is equal to a billion years. That's called the day-age theory. So let's think about the use of that word day. Esther fasted for three yoms, three days. Did she fast for three billion years? Nobody says that, do they? Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three yoms. Was he in the belly of the great fish for three billion years? Nobody says that. Was Jesus in the tomb for three billion years? Nobody says that. There's only one place in the Bible where people try to make those days into a long period of time. It's called Genesis chapter 1. And it's because we're coming to the Bible with a preconceived idea. Evolution is true. Billions of years are true. We've got to find a way to cram it into the Bible. Those days in Genesis, they must have been a billion years each. Well, can we do that? Well, first of all, the first three days, there's no sun. God says, let there be light. I don't think it's his radiance. Some people do. Maybe it was, but I don't. He didn't have to make that. He already had that. He says, let there be light. So the first three days are half light and half dark. So we have earth turning in front of a beam of light. You say those days are equal to a billion years each. Each day is half light and half dark. Okay, you have 500 million years of darkness followed by 500 million years of unrelenting light. Our solar system doesn't work like that. See, each one was half light and half dark. Now, anytime you have the Hebrew word yom for day with a number, one, two, three, four, it means normal day in the rest of the Bible. It just means a normal day. That's how each one is described in Genesis 1. Also, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, says there were days, there were seasons, there were years. Well, if a day is equal to a billion years, a Genesis 1 day, how long is a year? Is a year 360 billion, 365 billion years? See, it doesn't even make sense. God did everything he can do to the language to tell us, I'm talking normal days. Well, how old was Adam when he died? It says he was 930 years old. He lived through most of the sixth day. He lived through all of the seventh day. Was Adam 1 billion, 600 million, 930 years old when he died? Of course not. By the way, living to old ages, I don't believe is a problem before the flood in the days of Noah. I still hold to a water canopy of some sort. Hopefully, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, says right in the Ten Commandments. He's talking to people. How long are those days? Does anybody work for six billion years? No, we don't go off and work for six billion years. We know how long those days are. How long is your work week? Six days. We know that. 
Verse 11 of Exodus 20, right in the Ten Commandments, For in six days the Lord made the heaven, He made the earth, He made the sea. There's no heaven, no earth, no sea before the first day of the six-day week. That means you can't have a whole bunch of stuff between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 called a gap. Because there's nothing here before the first day of the six-day week. And then He made everything that's in them. So He made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them within the six-day week. And He set up His six-day work week with one day of rest. That's His creation week example. We still celebrate that. There's no reason to. There's no celestial indicators for a seven-day week. Did you know the French, during the French Revolution, they're going to become an atheistic society. We're going to do away with everything that has to do with God. They went to a ten-day week. Are the French still on a ten-day week? Nope, didn't work. They're back to a seven-day week. There's no reason for it, except that is God's creation week example, and we still celebrate it today. So there's nothing here before the first day of the six-day week. Now what does that mean? That means a pre-Adamic race of people. Nope, there wasn't any. There's no day-age theory. There's no gap theory. There's no theistic evolutionism. There's no progressive creationism. There's nothing here before the first day of the six-day week. Dr. Vance Havner once said, the isms of today will be the wasms of tomorrow. And I think that's true. I think that's exactly true. But you know, there's big gaps in the genealogical tables. There's plenty of room for evolution there. Well, it's about 4,180 years back to Abraham, so there's nothing missing there. The gaps would have to be between Adam and Abraham. And Jude 14 says, Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam, so there's nothing missing there. So there's, if there were big gaps in the genealogical tables to make room for evolution to happen, they would have to be between Enoch and Abraham. Let's say there were big gaps somewhere in the genealogical tables. Would that help with evolution? Well, no. Well, why not? Well, because we already have people. The genealogical tables are the generations of people. Now, evolution says people were the last thing to evolve. Well, if we already have people in the genealogical tables, starting with Adam, a people, what are you waiting to have evolve? You see, even if there were millions of years, they wouldn't help with evolution at all. Another thing, this is all one family. Adam, I'm sure, knew Lamech. That was his great, 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 great grandson. I'm sure Adam said, hey, Lamech, come over here, get in my lap. I want to tell you something, grandson. I never should have eaten of that fruit. By the way, Lamech, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Now, Lamech says to his grandson, Shem, hey, Shem, uh, come on, get in my lap, grandson. I want to tell you something. Your great, 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 great granddaddy told me he never should have eaten of that fruit. And by the way, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, Shem comes through the flood, comes out the other end. Did you know that Shem overlaps Abraham by about 50 years? I think they all knew each other. I think Adam told Lamech, who told Shem, who told Abraham. There's not this huge bunch of missing people in the genealogical tables. They were all one big family. I'm sure they all did that. But yeah, but isn't a day like a thousand years? The Bible says a day is like a thousand years. Second Peter chapter 3. But it also says that a thousand years is as a day in the same verse. Most people don't quote the rest of the verse, but you've got to read that in context. It's talking about three judgments in Second Peter 3. The second coming judgment, Jesus is coming to judge. Then it talks about destruction by flood. That's already happened. That's history. That's in Noah's day. And then there's going to be another judgment by fire. He's going to burn it all up. Now, what does all this mean? Well, judgment is coming, but our God is not willing for any to perish. That's the context. He says He wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants no one to perish as He waits for you and me to come to repentance. I think in the context, all He's saying is, a day is like a thousand years. On the day we came to repentance, if he waited a thousand years, it's like a day. I think that's basic. He's just telling us about his heart. His heart is that none should perish. That's 2 Peter chapter 3. I don't think we can use that to prove the days in Genesis are long periods of time. So John 1 says Jesus is the Creator, and He made everything, and He did it within a six-day week. Colossians 1 tells us the same thing, and it says He holds it all together. In Him it all consists. Well, now we have a problem. It's called the Missy Mass problem. There's not enough stuff out there to hold everything together. Well, then what's holding it together? Well, we don't know. Well, in my generation, you know what they said? It's invisible, cold, dark matter. That's what holds it all together. Now, that's not popular anymore. I guess it was so invisible they never found it. I don't know what happened to it. But it's, it, it, now there's some are saying, I think it's neutrinos hold us all together. Now, what's the problem here? 
God built the creation so that as we carefully study it, we're going to see, you know what? There's something else out there. There's something behind all of this. But man doesn't want to admit it's God. So we come up with our ideas. Well, everything holds together, invisible, cold, dark matter. What keeps the negatively charged electrons from plunging into the positively charged proton nucleus? Well, we don't know. They got all these theories. God says He keeps everything together. Praise God that He does. So Hebrews 1 says it's the same God that forgives us our sin. So God created man in His own image. Did God create Adam as a little baby? No, he's a full-grown man, day six. Let's say Michael the archangel walks up to Adam and he says, well, hello, in the Garden of Eden. Hello, my name's Michael. Adam says, well, my name's Adam. Michael says, well, Adam, how old are you? Adam says, 10 minutes. God just created me 10 minutes ago, just like I am. So God puts Adam to sleep. By the way, you young men, that's what you do about women. Go to sleep, okay? You go to sleep. By the way, you young women, don't wake them up, okay? At the right time, God will wake you both up. So God puts Adam to sleep, takes out a rib, makes Eve. Adam wakes up, takes one look at Eve. Whoa, man, which is woman. He says, Eve, you are beautiful. Uh, how old are you, Eve? Ten seconds. God just made me ten seconds ago, Adam, just like I'm 15 seconds old. Uh, Eve says, I'm hungry, Adam. Adam reaches up, picks a ripe peach, hands it to Eve. Man, Adam, what a farmer. How long does it take to grow a tree like that? Three days. You can't grow a tree with ripe fruit in three days. Yeah, if we're going to believe the creation account as it's written, we have to believe we have a God. He doesn't need time. He can create fully mature systems. They might have the appearance of age. They are not old. He doesn't need time. Same God that says He can forgive us all of our sins. Well, John 1 and John 2 parallel Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. In the Old Testament Greek, the LXX, the Septuagint, uh, they, they parallel John 1, in the beginning. Genesis 1, in the beginning. John 2, man into marriage. Genesis 2, man into into marriage. And then Jesus is going to do His first miracle at the wedding of Cana. What's He going to do? Well, it says there were set there for six water pots of stone. Could have been ten, could have been two. There's six. This is His first miracle, John chapter 2. Jesus told them to fill them up, so they filled them up. Then they took it to the, to the man that was in charge of the feast, and he tasted the water which Jesus had turned into wine. He said this in John chapter 2, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Well, how do you make good wine? Well, you have to age it. Well, how old is this wine? Two minutes. How many water pots? Six. How many days in the creation week when He created fully mature systems? Six. Do you think that's a mistake? No, God is calling our attention. I am the Creator. I'm now in my creation. I'm the one that did it back there in six days. I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to use six water pots. I'm going to create it, and it's going to taste like aged wine, just like I created Adam full-grown, fully aged, Eve fully aged. That's His first miracle. He did it to manifest His glory. Verse 11, the beginning of His miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory, and His disciples believed on Him. And then we get to the point where they're going to come and get Jesus at the end of His life. And so Peter grabs a sword. He's going to chop this fellow's head off. I think the fellow ducked. Peter gets his ear. Jesus picks it up, puts it back on. Maybe he made a new one. It doesn't tell us. But no scabs, no stitches, no healing, no time. The ear is back on. He's going to feed the 5,000. There's 5,000 men, it says. That could be 15,000 with women and children. So Jesus said, okay, guys, we're baking bread today, right? Uh, we're, we're, go out and buy 1,000 pounds of flour. We're going to bake bread. No, he's pulling fully baked loaves of bread and dried fish out of a basket, and he feeds maybe 15,000 people. It looked, if you would have eaten the bread, you would have thought that went through a time process. There was no time. If we're going to believe the Bible as it's written, we have to believe we have a Creator. He does not need time. He proved that with His miracles. We can believe the Bible. Jesus is the Creator who creates fully mature systems. And he says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but he commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so what does that mean? Well, that means all we have to do is put our faith and trust in him as our creator, redeemer. And have you done that? Do you believe the Bible as it is written? Is evolution fact or fraud? What you believe really does matter and will become the foundation for everything else you believe. As Dr. Martin mentioned, we hope you'll place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Creator and Redeemer. 
If you're not sure how to do this, please contact us at biblicaldiscipleship.org. Let us know if you've made this decision. We want to encourage and support you in your new life with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to learn more about creation and evolution, or if you'd like to get a copy of this or other videos, then go to our website at biblicaldiscipleship.org. Here you'll discover a wealth of resources about the origins of life and your daily walk with Jesus Christ. Make sure to be here next time where we'll dig into the long debate about eternal matter or eternal God. In session three, Dr. Martin will answer questions like, did the earth and our universe begin with purpose or probability? Was it cause or coincidence? Until then, on behalf of Biblical Discipleship Ministries, thanks for joining us in this four-part series, The Evolution of a Creationist.